man. Testing. Yep. Um, when I uh, walked into the church this morning, I felt all my courage to sing, leave me. And I thought, I'm just not going to do this. And then uh, a pastor in his sermon used two topics that are integral to this song. So I felt like Jesus was telling me, that's a sign you need to go ahead and sing this song. So, um, so the first thing that he mentioned was hope. And um, in the first chapter of Ephesians, of Philippians, and Colossians, Paul tells the believers that um, though this world, in this world you may suffer, and th this life may not be everything that you hoped it would be, but you have a hope that's beyond this life that's uh, guaranteed to you by Jesus Christ. And, um, and that's what this song is really about, is that hope. The second thing that he mentioned was John the Baptist. And uh, the guy that's credited with writing this song was Keith Green. And he was considered, when people refer to him, they refer to him as a modern John the Baptist. So I'm going to briefly tell you why. Number one, he was a guy, my brother would say, when he was saved, he was saved all over. So if he met somebody that he didn't know, he would work, get into the conversation salvation. He, he was very evangelical, and he, he just had to witness. If, if he felt that was his call. The second thing, he was very bold. And bold means um, he, da he dared challenge Christianity, the entertainment business at that time. He challenged it. He also felt there was hypocrisy in the American church, and it really bothered him. And he, uh, in several songs, maybe someday I'll, I'll do it. I don't know if Mel will let me. But anyhow, he's really critical of the church because of the of the hypocrisy, and it made it hard for me to witness to some people because of that. And his, his, his main statement was no compromise. He felt like God's word can never be compromised. And he saw people comp willing to compromise the word, and so he made it his standard that I will not compromise God's word. So, and then finally, like John the Baptist, John the Baptist was only on the stage for just a little while, and so was Keith Green. He started his recording business, recording songs in 1977. In 1982, he was dead. He died in, tragically in a plane accident with two of his children. So his time on the st world stage was brief. It was like a fire that burned out quickly. So uh, now let me say a little bit about this song. This song, he says, he's credited with writing, but he claims he never wrote it. He's, to hear him introduce the song, he would say, I was in a bad place. It had been two months, and I couldn't come up with any lyrics to a song at all. Lyrics means the words. He couldn't get any words. And he prayed, Lord, please help me. I want to continue my witness. Please help me to come up with some words. So he claims that God wrote the words to this song for him. And it's told through the eyes of the Lord. So when, you, when I sing it, it's like Jesus is speaking to each one of you all. That's how the song is written. And so this is when I hear the praises start by Keith Green. My son, my son, why are you striving? You can't add one thing to what's been done for you. I did it all while I was dying. Rest in your faith, my 
my peace will come to you when I hear the praises start I want to rain upon you blessings that will fill your heart I see no stain upon you cause you are my child and you know me to me you're only holy nothing that you've done remains only what you do for me My child, my child, why are you weeping? You will not have to wait forever. That day and hour is in my keeping. The day child and you know me to me you're only holy nothing that you've done remains only what you do for me just what you do for me say amen to that too. I was introduced to Keith Green many years ago and um, I still have in my files a, a number of the publications from his ministry and we thank the Lord for that and, and uh, his life. Hey, Ed, do you know whatever happened to his wife? I know she remarried. Do you... Is she? Oh, I wonder. All right, great. That's wonderful. Yeah, she don't like that song. Is that right? Um, I had a couple in our church over at Oak Hill, and they both were saved and, and um, out of Judaism, actually. Both were agnostic Jews. Uh, but they got saved, and, and they became 
uh, were exposed to his music and his writings and, and God used it. And he didn't live very long, but folks, it isn't how long you live, it's how well you live. What you do with what you got. And uh, as Ed said, uh, he, he lived life uh, all the way. Uh, he, I think he maybe had a premonition that wasn't gonna, God going to leave him here too long. So he lived to the fullest, and we ought to pray for the same thing. Open your Bibles tonight to Hebrews chapter 5. And uh, before I read the scriptures and we get into the Bible for just a minute, I want to uh, ask a couple of questions here. Who here tonight work for Shell Chemical Company? Raise your hand. All right, we got Rob back there. Okay, good. Rob will help me. In 1990, <laughs> you don't have to come up or anything, Rob. You can stay right where you are, okay? Okay. Um, in 1991, when, when my family and, and I moved to Cal Police, um, I had a job, a temporary job, and um, that job finished up, and, and I began to, to look for another work, other work, and I signed up with the, the um, employment office over in Cal Police, and then uh, I also came over here and signed up at the employment office here in Point, in Mason County. And uh, I got a call one day from the, one of the people, and they said, look, they're, they're hiring, or are going to be hiring at Shell. And uh, I think it was Shell Chemical then, I don't know. Anyway, uh, you know what I'm talking about. And, and said, if you're interested, come and put an application in, and they're going to give a proficiency test. And I said, okay, I can write. I can walk and chew gum, so I'm good. So I came over, I filled out the application, and then the day came to give the proficiency test. And, and there were several of us that came and took the test. And a couple of weeks went by, and um, I didn't hear anything. And I thought, wow, I'm going to go check this out. So I went back to the office one day, and I spoke to the lady, and she said, come with me. And so she takes me back, you know, in a little corner, and, and she said, now, she, I said, well, first of all, how did I do? And she said, you did very, very well. She said, you, you, you scored very high on the test, one of the best that took the test. But she said, I have to tell you that you're not going to get the job. And I looked at her and I said, I'm not going to get the job. She said, now, if you tell anybody I said this, she said, I'll tell them I, that you lied. because." But she said, you're too old. I was 42 years old. And I said, too old at 42? It's when it really started to hit me, you know. Anyway, I didn't get the job. But my question tonight for Rob is, if I had gotten the job, okay, never worked in a plant like that before in my life, had no background in anything like that, Rob, how long would it take a person just walking in green off the street like that with the, with the job, how long would it take a person to become proficient I mean, to know what they're doing and, and to become proficient in that plan. Well, give me, just guess one. Pull one out of the air. But you've worked there a long time. Tell me. Three years, four years, five years, a year? What? Five years. They want five years experience. Okay. So we're going to take five years. Okay? Somebody, and this is just, just a number. You'll see why in just a minute, all right? Now, we got some teachers here tonight. Who, who, who's, who's teacher? My wife's the teacher. Okay, how long does a, uh, uh, all right. how long does a teacher, Sarah, I'm going to pick on you. How, how long does a teacher have to go to school in college to, to get a teaching certificate? Okay, so she's got, you've got high school and four years of college, uh, to get a, a, a teacher's job, okay? So you got five years for the plant and four years for the teacher job just to start, okay? Now, Doc, where are you? There you are. Doc, I want you to help me. How many years of training does a doctor have to have before they can turn them loose to doctor people? Uh, well, there's four years of undergraduate Okay, so you got four years and four years, that's eight years, and then you've got three, four, five more years.
to be a doctor. So that's a lot of years, right? Let's, let's, let's just take five years and add to that. It's 13 years. Now, here's my question for you tonight. We're going to take the, the most highest standard, 13 years, for being a doctor. How many here have been saved 13 years or more? Let me see your hand. Wow. Praise the Lord. All right, put your hands down. How many of you would like to come who raised your hand, would like to come up on the stage tonight and explain to this congregation why Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek and not after the order of Aaron? <laughs> Don't all hurry up here. And somebody's saying, is he speaking in tongues? I mean, what is that about? There's a point to this, all this tonight. Look in Hebrews chapter 5, and I want to read a couple of verses to you. We're going to start in verse 11. Of whom, uh, let's go back to 10, because this is where Melchizedek comes in. Called of God a high priest, this is talking about Jesus now, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And you say, who in the world is Melchizedek? Well, you have to go back to the Old Testament to find out. And Melchizedek had a relationship with what Old Testament character? Abraham. Abraham. Thank you. You win the prize. All right. He says now, verse 11, of whom, of whom about the relationship to Jesus Christ to Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say to you. You say, how much could you say about Melchizedek and Jesus Christ? Well, don't get in a big hurry, but hold your spot. Turn over to chapter 7. And beginning in chapter 7 and verse 1, all the way through chapter 8, all the way through chapter 9, till chapter 10, verse 18, is all about Jesus Christ and Melchizedek. So he has a lot to say, right? He says, but, but the problem is they're hard to be uttered. These are not things that you can easily explain. They are challenging to you. But the biggest problem is you are hard of hearing. And then he drops the bomb on us tonight. Verse 12, for when, for the time you ought to be doctors or teachers or experienced operators in a factory, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong drink. Many years ago, um, my wife and I uh, went down to, uh, I think it's Louisville. Is, it, is Louisville where Southeastern Christian Church is, where Kyle Otterman preaches? Is it Louisville? Or I, I get them Lexington, Louisville. Anyway, it's one of them church, city, big cities down in Kentucky. And, and we stopped by this church. And man, it is super huge. If you've ever been there and have a chance to go there, it's really interesting to see it. And the guy is showing us around this church. And in the nursery, they have 500 cribs. That's what I said. Can you imagine being a nursery worker? I mean, whoa. And right over the door, they had the verse for the nursery workers. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So, no, no they, didn't. they didn't have that up there. <laughs> you didn't know there was a verse for babies, did you, in the Bible? Now, the reason I tell you that is this. Some fellows have suggested that if churches built their buildings appropriate for the spiritual condition of their congregation, that their buildings would be mostly nursery. Because too many people today People that have been saved a long time, the writer to the Hebrews says, are still babies. 
they don't ever grow up. Now, babies are cute. I want you to know that. I love babies. These little ones, you know, that come in here and they got their baby dolls and, and, and I get hugs from them and, and I love the little ones. But they grow up. Amen? Unfortunately, not too many Christians, at least not as many as we'd like, grow up. They're still babies. He said, that's your problem. He said, what we have to share with you is heavy duty stuff. This ain't just Jesus walking on the water. This isn't just Jesus healing somebody. This isn't just Jesus opening the eyes. This isn't the, the fun stuff of the Bible, the easy to swallow stuff. This is deep stuff, but it's important stuff. Now, Oh, tonight that you're thinking, Melchizedek, is he going to start preaching on that stuff? Now, just don't get all worried, okay? But I'm telling you something. There's a reason why he teaches this. There is a reason. It is significant that there is a difference between being after the order of the, the Aaron priesthood and the priesthood of Melchizedek. If Jesus is after the order of Aaron, then his priesthood ends. But his, if he's after the, the priesthood of Melchizedek, he has no beginning and he has no end. And Jesus Christ is our eternal priesthood. Just one thing. He spends three and a half chapters telling you that stuff. This is important. But you see, it's easy to get the stuff over in the Gospels. It's easy to enjoy the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water. And those things, it's easy to get back in the Old Testament and hear about old David slaying slay Goliath. It's easy to hear about the walls of Jericho coming down. Those things are easy. But when you get over in the New Testament epistles and you start getting into the book of Romans... Oh, my goodness. What shall I say then? Shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How should I that am dead to sin live any longer therein? That's powerful stuff. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Go over there in Romans 9, 10, and 11 and wait around in that for a while. Where God takes and he grafts in the church and grafts out the Jews. And, and, and man, I'm telling you, that, that's some stuff. Get over in the epistles in Ephesians where Paul begins to talk about our position in Christ Jesus and what that means. Talk about over in Philippians where he says that you are my joy and rejoicing. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I am prepared to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. You get into those kinds of things. And folks, you've got to kind of wade through those things. You don't just pick them up and eat them like pudding. You know, I mean, you've got to take into those things. And he said, there's a problem. And the problem is you're dull of hearing. Now, it just so happens that I know a little bit about hearing. So, I want us to think about what does this mean? What does he mean when he says that we are dull of hearing? Does that mean that we have a spiritual hearing problem? Well, first thing I want you to understand, it has nothing to do with your ears. Okay? He's not talking about that. He, he uses a, a natural thing to describe a supernatural thing or a spiritual thing. When I have patients would come into my office and they were dull of hearing, I knew that one of several things could be wrong. Number one, they could just have an ear full of wax. And I cleaned the wax out and boom, they can hear better. I had one fella worked on the boats. Every five, six weeks, whenever he would come in, I'm not kidding you, he would come into my office. He said, I'm going out in so many days, would you check my ears? And I would just, I'd dig a boatload out of his ears, man. Oh, now I can hear again. Wow. If there were hearing problems, that's one of the first things you check for. Sometimes the problem was damage, nerve damage to those little tiny hair cells back in the ear. And, 
And if that was the case, there was no remedy for that. The doctor couldn't give them medicine to fix it, so we would fit them with hearing aids, and that would enhance what they had left and enable them to hear better. Sometimes it was a physical problem. One of the most popular problems was otosclerosis. That simply means that that little bone, we call it the stapes or the stirrup that you might be familiar with, it has a window in there. It's an oval window, and that stapes moves back and forth when the eardrum vibrates. Those other bones communicate to it, and it creates motion, and those motions move those little nerves. But if that otosclerosis gets around the foot plate of that stapes, it's, it won't move, and the hearing gets dull. So the doctor can go in, and I had one patient of mine, her, she complained about her son for years to me. He just can't hear, he just can't hear. I said, well, bring him in. She said, well, he doesn't want to come. He doesn't want to come. And I said, well, I can't help him if he doesn't come. He came in, I gave him a test. I said, oh, your problems, you got otosclerosis. Don't tell anybody I said that. I'm not supposed to diagnose things. I sent him to a good doctor. The doctor operated on him, and to this very day, he can hear really well. So I could tell that there are issues, and then some things that I couldn't determine and couldn't help, and I would have to send them away. But this is not a hearing problem with your ears. This is a hearing problem with your heart. He says, here, here's what we're facing here. He said, I've got some stuff for you. It's hard to understand. This is deep stuff, but it's good to understand it. It will put some, some, as Daddy used to say when I was growing up, it'll put hair on your chest. I mean, it'll put some spiritual hair on your chest, not on your head, but in your chest. I mean, it, it will help you to grow up. It'll put cement in your shoes. It'll help you to stand when things are not so good. It will give you a new perspective on life. But you've got to be able to get it. You've got to be able to receive it. So what is he talking about? He said, we have many things to say hard to be uttered, but they are, you're dull of hearing. Here it is. He says, it isn't that they can't hear. The real problem is they don't ever mix faith with what they hear. If I can make it even plainer for you tonight, they don't ever do anything about what they hear. They hear about Jesus walking on the water. They hear about Goliath being slain by David. They hear about, you know, the walls of Jericho falling down. They hear about all of these great miracles that Jesus performed and all the words that he said and all the things that he did. And they say, wow, that's really interesting. The preacher was good today. And they don't do one thing about what they hear. That's what he's talking about. He said, you've been saved a long time. You have exercise faith a long time ago. You've heard thousands of sermons. You've heard enough sermons to save the world. But he said, you're not doing anything about what you hear. It's just kind of sitting there and sour. It's nice. It's fun. It's good. It's interesting uh, sometimes. And, and, I, and you like it. You, you keep coming back for more. You just don't do anything with it. You don't mix faith with the word and respond. That's how you grow. So because of that, he says, here's what I know about you. For when the time you ought to be teachers, we had a bunch of hands go up. If you'd been studying all that time, you could all be doctors and making a lot of money, see? For the time you ought to be teachers, you need that one teach you again the things that be the first principles of the oracles of God. And he says, there you have become such as have need of milk and not of strong drink. Now, if you've had children and babies, you know what that's all about. Nasty smelling stuff. I don't know how in the world the kids drink it, but you know, you get that bottle and you plug it in and man, boy, that thing, that little babies go to work on that stuff, you know. And, they drink milk. It has all the nutrients that they need. It has what they need to grow for a while. And it's easy. 
they don't have to hardly even swallow. It just sort of runs down the pipe, you know, right into the stomach and into the system and right on through. It's easy. Isn't that where people are today too many times? Just give me the easy stuff. Give me the palatable stuff. Give me that stuff I don't have to work too hard to figure out. Just, just, you know, tell me one more time about how David sued Goliath. Tell me one more time how the walls came tumbling down. Tell me one more time how Jesus raised the dead. Tell me one more time how he opened the eyes of blind Bartimaeus. There's nothing wrong with that. We need those stories. We need to understand those truths. But folks, we need to move forward. We need to move on. We need to grow up. We need to get past some of that. That's a foundation. And we need to do something about what we hear when we hear those things. So he goes on. He said, I I just, I, I don't know what to say. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe. Now, babes are wonderful things, but babes were designed to grow up. They weren't designed to stay babies. We had our family together this week, and Ellie was there, and it just, it seems like she's grown every time I see her since she's been away. And I I just listened to her talk, and I said, wow, my baby's growing up. She uses words that I don't even know what they mean. I mean, you know. And she's growing up and maturing, and she's growing up physically, and, she, and she's growing intellectually, and she's learning new things. She is growing. He said, but unfortunately, you haven't gone very far in your spiritual walk. Hold your spot here for just a minute and jump over to James chapter 1. It's just the next book over. James chapter 1 and verse 21. Here's what James says. He says, Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Here it is. Be ye, what? What's the word? Doers of the word and not hearers only. If you just listen to it and don't do anything about it, you are deceiving yourself. That's what he says. If any be a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man look, beholding his natural face in a, mirror, in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You ever been in an airport? You're walking through the airport, the airport from time to time, comes on with a little slogan, you know, about, you know, don't let anybody give you anything to take on the plane that you didn't bring with you. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do this. You can't take this. You can't take that. Now, if you've been in an airport very much, you hear it, but you don't hear it. And that's what happens to us. We hear it, but we don't really hear it. That's what James is talking about. Verse 25, he said, But whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, him be not a forgetful here. Here it is, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. I'm going to read a statement to you. I want you to listen. The pathway to maturity is not to become more intelligent is to become more obedient. Let me say it again. The pathway to maturity is not to become more intelligent, but more obedient. There are many intelligent, smart people who choke on the things of God, while there are those who are less educated, but are deeply mature and easily feed on the deep things of God. I've met folks in church ministry through the years, and those guys hardly ever got past high school if they got that far. But I'm telling you something, they knew something about God that I didn't know. They knew about God's Word and God's truth in ways that I didn't get a hold of, and I had to learn and grow into that place. They were not considered by the world to be intellectual, but I'm telling you, they were spiritual giants. 
It isn't about your noggin, it's about your heart. It's about your commitment to God's word. And not just to hear it, but to do something about what you hear. When you start chewing on it and you appropriate it and you let it make growth and development in your life, then you're able to grow up and you're able to mature. Now, he wraps all this up in in verse number uh, 14. And he tells us about the mature person, the mature Christian. Strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have had their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Their diet. What's their diet? Strong meat. The better translation is solid food. You see, he's been comparing everything to milk. He said, folks that, need to, that want to grow need to learn to eat solid food. Doesn't mean you have to have T-bone or porterhouse every meal, but folks, it needs to be solid food. It needs to be a balanced diet. You need some vegetables, you need some greens, you need some this, you need some that, you need some milk, you need some food. You just need to have a balanced diet. You need to just get out of that the sweet Jesus stuff all the time and get over into the hard stuff. And you need to take some of those things that the scripture talks about and wrestle with them for a little while. And say, God, help me to know. This, these chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10 through chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 18 in Hebrews, I'm talking about some stuff. You better buckle up when you go into those chapters. But boy, if you can wade through that and get out on the other side of it, Man, I'm telling you what, your faith will have muscles on top of its muscles. Their diet is the, it is the solid food of the scriptures. We all love the exciting. We all love the dramatic. We all love those things that we are familiar with. But sometimes we need to get in some unfamiliar territory. I remember when my mom used to sit down and, and fix something new for dinner. And my brother and I would sit there and watch my dad. If he didn't eat it, we didn't eat it. <laughs> and it didn't make my mother so mad. We used to eat something, I don't know if y'all have it around here, or heard of the rutabaker. Anybody ever heard of rutabaker? Okay, okay, well, I didn't want sure. When I went down to, to visit my uh, cousin, and my brother and, and some friends down there, I met my cousin for lunch, and we're getting some, at this you know, little restaurant there, and that's where she wanted to meet. And, and I said, what's that right there? She said, that's rutabaker. Oh, I said, give me some. I hadn't had that for a long time. I loved it. It's good. But the first time I ate rutabaker, I didn't like it. You ever done that? Sure. First time you get into some of this solid food, you may have to back up a little bit and chew on it a little while. But if you want to be mature, if you want your feet under you, if you want those spiritual muscles, you got to have the right diet. What does he say next? It says you have to have the right discipline. In verse 14, strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use. You got to use the word You ever heard the old statement, no pain, no gain? They become consistent in the word. Folks, I'm going to tell you something, and I love you, and I love you being faithful on Sunday nights, and we have a big crowd on Sunday morning, and then we have our faithful people on Sunday night, and I love you for it. But listen, if you don't do anything with it, it doesn't change your life. By reason of use, they have to exercise themselves. They have to take that word. They have to apply that word. They have to pray that word. They have to be in the scriptures, not just on Sunday and Wednesdays, but every day. They need to know how to get a hold of God. They know the importance of being in God's house and in God's word. And what they learn, they use to serve him and others. If all we do is eat, guess what happens? We all ought to know that this week, right? 
what did you do this week? Well, we ate and we sat around. And we ate some more and we sat around. And we are much, much bigger people than we were than last Sunday. You can't just eat, folks. You got to exercise. There has to be a discipline. Then it tells us, last of all, that there is discernment. Who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. I suppose uh, of in ministry for a pastor, this is one of the things that breaks a pastor's heart. When he sees people that have been saved five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, and they're out there dabbling in things that are just gonna get them in trouble. And they, they can't see, or they don't see, that the choices they're making are dangerous choices for their spiritual walk. It's not they're gonna lose their salvation, they're going to miss a lot of good things. And they're going to guarantee the fact that they're going to have heartache. Now, I want you to understand this idea of discernment. When I was growing up, we had our list. You know, what the, you had the list. And, you, you know, you don't do this and you don't do that and you don't go here and you don't, you know, and, and you know, you just had the list. And so it's easy to check the list off. The problem is, what if it wasn't on the list? Well, we don't have any list anymore. We thought that was too legalistic. So we threw all the list away, and now we're just free to make that choice ourselves. But the problem is, we don't have any discernment, and so we make stupid choices. He said, people that are mature, they have a diet of solid food. They exercise themselves thereby so that they're Moral senses, their moral decisions are directed by the word where there is no rule, where there is no list, where there is no other direction. What should I do? I've got it. Because I have inside of me, inside of my spirit, I have the Holy Spirit and I have the Word of God and the Word of God is dwelling in me richly and the Spirit of God can take the Word of God and He can direct my path and keep me out of trouble and help me to make decisions where there's no rules, there's no books, there's nobody. I'm on my own, I'm in a situation I think about all these young people that we have sitting down here on Sunday morning, and I thank God for them. But folks, they're navigating waters that you and I don't even have a clue about. They need to grow up. And we need to be part of doing that. That's our responsibility as spiritual leaders. It's our responsibility as church members is to get these kids rooted in the Word of God so that they have the discernment to when they're out on that date and that, guy, and that situation arises, what should I do? They know, so get out of there. In fact, even better than that, they know who should, they shouldn't go on a date with. He says... Don't be those babies. You've been saved long enough. Doesn't mean everybody ought to be standing up here teaching, but you ought to be able to explain your faith. You ought to be able to give an answer for the hope that lieth within you. You ought to be able to tell people why you believe this is the word of God and it's never changed. You ought to be able to defend the fact that Jesus Christ is the son of God. You ought to be able to tell people how to get to heaven. You ought to be able to take this book and live a life that pleases God. But you can't do that with milk. Milk is get you started, but you need solid food and you need exercise and we need to grow up in Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us Forgive me. Forgive us when we take the easy path. Forgive us when we reading through a book of the Bible and we find something that's hard and we just kind of skip over it. 
We love Psalms 23. We love David slaying Goliath. We love Jesus raising the dead. We love those things. We love them and they're wonderful and they're special and they're blessed, but we need more. We need to grow up. We've had enough time. We've been saved long enough that we should now be able to teach others. Forgive us. And God help us in our own hearts tonight, in our own lives, to purpose. Not to abandon the milk, but to get some strong meat, to get into a balanced diet, to get into some things that will help us to really grow spiritually, to quit just hearing your word and not doing anything about it, but help us, God, to be responsive, not for the preacher's sake, but for the Spirit's sake that speaks to us and draws us to it and opens the truth up to us. Help us, God, to respond and be obedient because it isn't about knowing more, God. It's about obeying more, saying yes to God's word and God's spirit as we grow and mature and serve. Have your will and way now in this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.